Today we chat with Pete Early, a storyteller whose books include four New York Times bestsellers like The Hot House and Crazy. His years as an investigative journalist include six at The Washington Post. He's a tireless advocate for mental health system reform, and I'll tell you why. A lot of listeners ask, what about the dads? Well, he knows, and he was most recently seen on the PBS documentary Hiding in Plain Sight with his son, Kevin Mike Early. So today we hear their family's story, lots of thoughts on what we'd like to change about the system, including NAMI's current focus. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. I uh, am a little late because I've been looking through my bookshelves for everybody's books. And I can't find them. <laughs> I loan a lot of them out uh, and... You know, I need to start keeping track of whose book went where. So sorry about it's, that. It's yeah. okay. I, I had to go looking for yours. And there's a little post-it note on that says, write to him, website. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pete, your book was the first book I ever read when Nick got sick. It was the first one that it was like, oh, my God, somebody else went through this. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I actually... Like, I was going to say, I actually met you when your first book came out because I was on the National NAMI board and you were our guest speaker and we had a little luncheon for you. So, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, that was a long time ago. And I was very impressed that you had, you know, had it together with all the things we deal with to actually write a book. I hadn't realized at the time you were a professional writer, so it made more sense then. (laughs) Well, Pete's got like 21 books, I think. Yeah, my last, hopefully my last one comes out in March. So that'll be 22. I figure I've had my say after 22 books. <laughs> time to, uh, you know, I, I since then else. read The Hot House, which then it, that really made sense then. Why you, you know, how you were able to get in all those prisons and yeah. do all that research and yeah. enjoyed The well, Hot House. It was Judge Lightman who got me in. I mean, I, oh, really? tried, I lasted, uh, I, well, at the time in LA, the sheriff, Baca, was, uh, had an uncle who had been shot to death by police, uh, he had mental illness. And anyway, he let me in, but it only lasted two days because the um, uh, mental health people uh, complained that it was a HIPAA violation. They didn't want me to see it. So then I went to Cook County Jail. I said, no, Rikers Island said no. Tried Baltimore, they said no. I tried Washington, D.C., and they literally said, hell no. And, <laughs> uh, the Treatment Advocacy Center gave me Judge Lightman's name, and he was the one who got me into the Miami-Dade uh, uh, jail for 10 months. So he's a real oh, trooper, right. and he is, he's got solutions. And he's been down the track when it comes to the criminal justice system. And he's got a lot of clout. Judges have a lot of clout. But his what he's done in Miami uh, since my book came out has really been, you know, kind of turned it into the gold standard. Right. Oh, good. Right. We're going to work really hard on uh, getting him on the podcast because you're about the third guest to sing his praises. So Pete Early is on. Uh, was most recently seen on the PBS documentary with his son, proudly using his real name, Kevin now, and uh, hidden, uh, hiding in plain sight is the name of it, right? And Kevin Mike Early is his son. But way before that, both Mindy and Mimi and I all read his book, which I have right here, Crazy. A Father's Search Through America's Mental Illness madness. And Pete has been a timeless, uh, a tireless advocate for his son. And as an investigative journalist of so many years, an author of soon to be 22 books, as you say, you have a lot to say, you've got a fantastic blog and you've been very supportive of this podcast and of us as authors. And we so appreciate you. And last time I think I saw you, Pete, you and I were in Warsaw, Poland. Yeah, that's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. Let's hear a little more about that. <laughs> we, we were present. I think I was your warm up act or you. I were don't think mine. so. No, whatever. Anyway, we were both presenting to a pharmaceutical 
company a meeting of their sales reps in Warsaw. And we each spoke about our stories and then told them, please keep making more medication that works and please sell it so that people can use it. And it was a, it's a great experience and we got to, to chat. So yeah, that yeah. was quite a while ago, but anyway, so welcome. And just before we get into, we're titling this episode, the same as your book, A Father's and Son's Continuing Search Through America's Mental Health Madness. But I do want to mention that today I heard, we've been talking about the 988 crisis line and NPR did a wonderful story on it today, including two happened to be moms, one who lost her son to police shooting because they didn't know how to handle a crisis and one whose son got immediate help when a crisis unit was set, was sent out spoke to her son with respectful tones and words and got him straight into a crisis center. And so the hope for 988 when it rolls out is that instead of just calling 911 and getting police who may or may not be equipped to handle a crisis or trained to handle a crisis, you will get a crisis, a mobile crisis unit. And it's also the suicide hotline. So 988 rolling out fully soon, but it, you may want to catch the NPR story on it, on all things considered, because it was, it was great. So welcome, Pete Early. I think I've pretty much said who you, who you are on um, the Hot House is one of your books, Crazy, A Father Search Through America's Mental Health Madness. You've got a fantastic, very, <clears throat> you've got a fantastic, very active blog and you're a tireless advocate. Uh, it's very kind of you. Yeah, crazy refers to our system. I always like to point that out because crazy is one of those words that kind of the red flag word that gets people upset. But I used it intentionally to refer to the system. And yeah. uh, when you're talking about 988, you know, I was on the federal, a federal panel that really started pushing that. And the, the idea is brilliant. You have somebody who can triage calls and say immediately, okay, this person uh, needs to have a therapist. And ideally, the operator can say, okay, I've used my electronics connections and you have a therapist and you can go in and see that therapist. Uh, next Tuesday, I've already made the appointment for you. And then you have someone who calls in, they say, well, you need, you need to be evaluated. We're dispatching a mobile crisis response team. And then you have someone who calls in and you go, wow, you need a little, you need to go to a drop-off center. Uh, you know, here's how you get there and how, how can we facilitate that? And then in the end, you know, of course, is uh, we need to send uh, the police to come in. Now that's the ideal structure they've had luck with it down uh, outside Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, but as with everything in mental health, the ideal and then getting it actually to happen on the trenches where you guys are is such a wide, wide gap. And uh, I didn't hear the NPR thing. I'll look it up right after this program, but I did see, uh, I know that many states they, they don't have the access, they don't have those services. You know, Fairfax County is one of the richest um, counties in the United States. I mean, the average household income is about 165,000 a year. Uh, you know, compared to the national average household income, I think is around 60. So it's a three, almost three times that. And yet we only have two mobile crisis response teams. They don't work 24 hours a day. It's a county of five uh, of two million people, and how can how can you possibly respond when the police are getting uh, you know averaging uh, four to five hundred calls a month, and you know so it it gets frustrating. It That's gets the same problem we have here in Minnesota. So our state NAMI is not publicizing it very well. They are doing a soft education. It was you know on Facebook, but there are no big billboards and ads because of not building up expectations. Because if you call and then there's nothing to send or no place, if someone is sent for them to take you, what good does it do? Exactly. And that's, you know, that's the problem when we fought so hard to get uh, <clears throat> jail diversion, crisis intervention team trained officers, 
uh, mental health court, and all these things, the uh, sequential intercept model, identifying when you can get somebody uh, who's in crisis, who ends up in jail or prison, how you can get them into services. But then when you have no housing, you have no, no transportation, you have no job facilities. I mean, I look at my son's story and what really helped him were services. It wasn't me. It was services and a really great social worker. And well, so let's 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 get to that. And you know, we could talk about nine eight eight, and we'll probably in the future devote a whole show to it because you're correct, Pete. I mean, if it's great to have a number, but if there's no services to send out when somebody calls that number, I think that's why they're rolling it out so slowly. So we all love the idea and we need it not to be crazy and make it work. So thank you for, for pointing all that out. That's that's so important. We all know what the wait lists are, um, waiting times for therapists and evaluations. So one step at a time, but let's back up a bit. And uh, you, first of all, if, if this is the first time you're listening to our podcast, because you're a Pete Early fan, and uh, Mimi and Mindy and I are each moms. We each have a grown son with schizophrenia, and we're each continuously facing our own challenges with that. But we are finding some solace and some purpose in advocacy and in having this podcast. So we're happy to be here with Pete, who is also the parent of someone with a serious mental illness. And we want to hear a bit about the father's point of view, as well as the investigative journalist point of view. But let's start with the dad part. So if somebody doesn't know your story and didn't read your book, crazy, um, tell us about somebody called Mike in the book, but now who is proudly using his name, Kevin. Tell us a bit about your story and what it was like for you as a dad. Well, first, thanks for having me on. And my heart goes out to you because schizophrenia, as we all know, is, in my opinion, the absolute worst mental illness and the toughest to deal with. Um, so my son's mental illness came without warning. He was an art student at the Pratt uh, Institute in New York. And we talked every Saturday. I live outside Washington, D.C. And we talked every Saturday. And one morning he says, Dad, food doesn't taste good. And then he said, Dad, uh, I took four homeless people to breakfast today. And I said, well, what? And he says, dad, I'm having trouble. I can't tell the difference between whether I'm dreaming or awake. So I rushed to New York. And um, now this is an important point. He went willingly with me to see a psychiatrist. And that is such a wonderful opportunity when they have that first break to get them in because they want to know what's going on too. Uh, but what happened? We went to see a psychiatrist and he said, if you're lucky, your son is using drugs. Hmm. If you're not lucky, he has a mental illness, bipolar disorder. And I thought, what? Lucky if he's using, well, a blood test showed he wasn't using drugs. So I said, bipolar disorder, I, you know, I vaguely, what it, what he said, your son has an incurable disease. He will be sick all of his life. He will have to take medications that probably will make him gain a lot of weight, make him prone to diabetes. It's unlikely he'll really be able to hold down a job. It's unlikely he'll ever be able to get married. Uh, people with bipolar disorder often end up in encounters with the police and end up um, you know, in jail or homeless. Or And he said, I gotta be frank with you, people with mental illness die 15 to 20 years faster or quicker than the normal people, uh, you know, people without mental illness. And I walked out of that and I thought, man, this, this is my son. This guy's, this guy's way off. Mm -hmm. And uh, he prescribed medication and Kevin did well for, for uh, several weeks. And I thought, see, that guy was just a quack. You know, he was over dramatic <laughs> and everything's fine. Well, flash forward a year and I get a frantic phone call. Uh, Kevin is wandering around Manhattan. He hadn't slept for five he hadn't eaten for five days. He barely slept. He was sure God had him on a secret mission. I raced in New York, convinced him to get in the car, drove four hours down. I didn't know where to go. So I went to head into an emergency room. And during that ride, he would laugh one minute and then begin sobbing the next. And he was seeing secret messages, dog is God. And we went in the emergency room and uh, the nurse rolled her eyes and 
while he was talking nonsense and they put us in a room and we waited and waited and waited and waited. And after four hours, Kevin said, I'm going to leave. And I literally raced out and I grabbed a doctor. I'll never forget. He came in with his hands up as if he was surrendering. And he said, I can't help your son. And I said, what? You haven't even looked at him. He said, Virginia law is very specific. Unless you're in imminent danger to yourself or others, you can't be required to enter treatment. And the nurse told him Kevin thought pills were poison. He didn't want to take any. And we'd been there four hours. So then he turned to me and he said, look, you seem like a concerned dad. Bring your son back after he tries to hurt you or someone else. Oh, yeah. So I took my son home and 48 hours later, he slipped out of the house. He broke into a stranger's house. Luckily, no one was there. He broke in to take a bubble bath to wash away his sins. It took five police officers and an attack dog to get him out. And my son became one of the 2.2 million people who are booked into jails every year. He's charged with two felonies. Um, I've kind of cut that short. Let me add just one other thing to this. And then I'd like to talk about uh, eventually his recovery, which we, if we have time for that. When they got him, they took him over to the mental health center and I raced over and a policeman was outside and he said, let me give you advice. Unless you go in and you tell that psychiatrist he's threatened to kill you, he will not be committed. Uh, he will not be held involuntarily. Uh, and I said, well, he hasn't threatened that. He said, okay, well, let your conscience be your guide. So I went in and I lied. And that was getting good enough to get him held for 72 hours. Um, and I thought, finally, he's going to get some help. Well, 24 hours later, I got a call from his doctor. Um, the insurance company was saying he didn't need to be in jail or weren't going to pay. So the hospital was going to discharge him. Uh, and I got nowhere until I mentioned that I used to work at the Washington Post. And I knew Mike Wallace at CBS. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and Mike Wallace actually called and said, why is Pete Early's son being discharged before even the 72 hours? And, and they went, oh, oh, oh. And all of a sudden, my son was allowed to stay for 14 days in that hospital. He, he voluntarily committed himself. And that's when I found out he was being charged with two felonies, breaking, entering, and destruction of property. And I was so frustrated because the law had said I couldn't intervene and help him, but now I wanted to punish him. And I just thought that was outrageous. And then I learned that, uh, you know, 365,000 people with mental illnesses are in our jails and prisons. Uh, they stay uh, much longer than anyone else. They cost more. It, it's just a nightmare. But those are where we're sending our people. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I went to Miami-Dade for uh, 10 months. I'd go out for several weeks and then come home. And I followed people through the system to see what happened to them because I wanted to see that before I talked to all the experts. Meanwhile, you know, and I'm sure you, all three of you have been through this. Um, Kevin got better. Medication really helped him. He did great. And then um, he stopped. He was on probation two years. They stopped taking his meds. And so I thought, you know, God, I'm a pretty smart guy here. Uh, <laughs> I can handle this. So I, I tried logic and um, I divided a legal pad in half and I said, oh, look, this is when you're doing well. And oh, look, this is when you're not. Oh, look, this is when you're on meds and this is when you're not. Well, I found out you can't talk logic to someone who's not thinking logically. So I tried bribery. I said, I'll pay you 50 bucks a week, Kevin, if you take your medication. And he looked at me and said, dad, I'm not a prostitute. <gasps> then I tried <laughs> duplicity. And I ground up his medicine. And I put it in his breakfast cereal. And he was suspicious when he got up. But why did you fix me cereal? And what we discovered was he was taking Depakote and the hard pink shell floats. And so he knew immediately. And he accused me of trying to poison him. We had a huge fight. I told him, I did the dad card. If you're going to live here, you have to take. And he called me names. And I had to drive him to my ex-wife's house. He was so furious. He jumped out of the car. And then I thought, okay, I got to get professional help. So I called the mobile crisis response team. And I got the dispatcher. And I said, my son's off his meds. Uh, he, he, last time, that, no, you can't judge him what happened last time. Call us if he's dangerous. Two nights later, my ex-wife was locked in the bathroom 
calling me frantically. I went over, Kevin chased me out of the house like Rocky raising his hands. I called the dispatcher and I said, this time I knew what to say, you know? Mm. And I said, please come, my son is violent. And he says, wait a minute, is he dangerous or violent? And I said, he's violent. Oh, we don't come if he's violent. So the police came and shot him twice with a taser and took him away. So that, of course, that just broke my heart. And I'm sure like you, and I only admit this to people who have, um, have loved ones with serious mental illness. I remember seeing him laying on his belly, hands handcuffed, chained to his feet, officers making fun of him, baiting him on, and me thinking, is this his life? Mm -hmm. Would it, I actually thought, would have been better he had never been born. Well, let me tell you that, and I know I'm taking a lot of time, but let me tell you uh, what eventually happened. After five hospitalizations, six years, uh, last time he went off his meds, it was uh, Thanksgiving, he could tell that I knew he was off his meds. So he bolts out of the house, he jumps in the car and he starts driving my calling, he answers his cell phone. And I say, where are you going? He says, heaven, and hangs up. Well, he ran out of gas in North Carolina. Wait, when, when was this last incident? This, this was kidding? six years after his first break. Okay, so how many years ago is this? Actually, uh, we're just celebrating, and I was going to get to that. And we're okay. just celebrating our 12th year of him doing great. Okay, great. So this so is what six happened, years after. Okay. Yeah, so we've been through this, five hospitalizations, the taser. He's down in North Carolina out of gas, and he calls me, and he says, I'm out of gas. And I said, we'll go get some gas. He says, no, dad, you don't understand. The voices are telling me that if I step out of this car, I'm going to die. And he was terrified. So I arranged for him to get gas. He drove completely psychotic up I-95, went off the road twice, came home. Well, by that time, I talked to Tom Insel, the former head of the National Institutes of yeah. uh, Mental Health. And he told me, you have to partner with your, with, with your kid. You can't be the parent, you gotta be the partner. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful phrase, it's pretty damn difficult to do, but I said, what do you wanna do? And he said, there's a safe house. So I took him to this safe house, checked him in, left. He got up in the middle of the night and took off all his, all his clothes because you know, when you take off your clothes, you're invisible. And he went walking out. Now this is the part of the story that gives me such hope. A CIT trained officer spotted him. He said, let's go to the emergency room, uh, you know, get you checked out. And Kevin said, don't handcuff me. That's when I got tasered. I'm not a criminal. And the guy used his discretion, just put him in the back seat. Then the guy said to him, what kind of music you like? And Kevin said, rap. Aww. And so he Thanks. turned a rap station on. Oh, it gets better. They got to the emergency room. And he, Kevin said, well, this is better than a taxi ride. And it shook his hand. And the officer said, no, I'm going to stay here with you. And the doctor came in to see him. And the doctor said, well, it's not dangerous to be walking around naked in Fairfax County. That's not enough to get you on a hold you here because it's he hasn't done anything. And the officer looked at him and he said, oh, Dr. Smith, OK, I'm going to look up where you live and I'm going to drop him <laughs> off on your front lawn. And all of a sudden he was admitted. And that was the beginning of Kevin's recovery. The key point was Kevin um, acknowledged finally that he had an illness. And I'm absolutely convinced until you have someone who admits they have an illness, you can't, you can't get them, you can't lead them to the water. It's just this ongoing fight. The next thing was the social worker said, you know, you can't, you're too old to live with your dad. Uh, he was 30. Um, so she put him in a housing project with two people with schizophrenia. And I thought that was silly. It was the greatest thing because he had self, you know, respect. He was respect. Then she said, what are you going to do? I can't do anything. I, you know, I, I have mental illness. And she said, no, control the illness. Don't let it control you. And he got a job. My college educated son, a high IQ was the guy at Home Depot picked up carts and he got depressed. And 
his social worker saw him and said, you're doing great. And he thought she was mocking him. And then she said, no, come to one of my groups. And he did. And he found out he was doing great. And he liked it. Uh, and she said, I have a perfect program for you, which is peer to peer, a person with mental illness helping people. And my son went from someone who needed help to someone who was going to help other people. And that was another step in his recovery. He got certified. And now I got to tell you that uh, it's been a year now. My son just graduated with a master's degree in social work. He works full time as a peer support specialist in Arlington County. And he was on the helping. And I realized that we are so fortunate because, it, you know, we finally got the help that enabled him to go forward. And I forgot one last thing and I'll shut up here. Um, you know, my son has had seven psychiatrists. Only two have ever bothered to learn anything about him except his name and his diagnosis. And that's because they're going to get paid for a 15 minute med check and shove them out the door. He finally got a doctor who listened to him, treated him as a person. And they worked together to get a medication that had few side effects. And it, it's, it's just getting a pill isn't the answer. And it's so dehumanizing to go see a doctor and they don't care about anything. I mean, he wanted to talk to him about why he felt this way or this. And, it, you know, no, I got 15 minutes. Just take your pill and leave. That was key, too, to have a doctor who cared. So yeah. I'm sorry for the length of that. You can edit okay. it down. <laughs> I mean, there's so much in your story. And I do want to point out to the listeners that bipolar is a, is a very different illness from schizophrenia. Yep. However, when you get to a place of psychosis, psychosis is psychosis. So when your son got to that, and that was in the NPR story today as well, um, when he got very, very manic and didn't sleep and, you know, in the mania, in the psychosis, it feels like the way schizophrenia feels to us for our sons. Um, I don't know the statistics, but I believe that golden moment when your son realized that he did have an illness that could be managed is a little harder to come by in schizophrenia. Absolutely. And, and, and frankly, in the hiding in plain sight, I found that piece woefully missing. Yeah. All of those wonderful, wonderful kids, most of them were kids talking about their illnesses. I'm so happy for them that they, they had the insight and that they found each other and that they found the respect. But- I understand that, your frustration. Yeah, there no. was no mention of what about the people who, who, were, who are where your son was before realizing I'm not sick, you're the uh, one who's uh, sick. So that is just, but but I, I love your story because there are similarities when your son was in psychosis, absolutely. But I just wanna make it clear to our listeners that we know that it, there are differences as well. Absolutely. But, but yeah. I wanna ask about is the fact that you are a dad compared to a mom. And um, you know the, we always think as mothers, and I've noticed this when I was in my, 20 years in the Minnesota state legislature, a woman could, this was a joke amongst us women legislators, a woman could say something in the caucus, you know, make some very important points and then sit down and the men would just kind of, you know, talk amongst themselves. And then some man would stand up and say the very same thing. And then all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, what yeah. a great idea, what a great idea. And so when you're, you as a dad, you're, you your Kevin's mother was involved when she had him, you, you know, were divorced, but you were working as a team, as I recall from your book, or communicating anyway. But when you know, you could call um, uh, Mr. Wallace and Tom Menzel, and you had your connections with the right. Washington Post, and people are afraid of publicity in the mental health system. Right. Um, you know, I, I could say I'm going to call the Attorney General and I knew him on, you know, I could have could call him on a first name basis when they weren't going to cover the insurance anymore. And then they would, you know, but that's the dirty little secret about the mental health system. Never mind about mothers versus fathers. You know, if you have power, if you can ex say you're going to right. expose them, then they do hop to and do different things than they would have if 
uh, if you weren't speaking out. And so you have families who are, you know, afraid to talk about their child's mental illness, or they don't want to ruin their future. And then they don't have that kind of power. But the father voice versus the mother's voice, could you talk about that a little bit? Um, you know, a lot of mothers talk about that a lot. You know, the men can be listened to, but yet we're the ones doing everything. You're a rarity that you're doing all of this. I never hear anything about your ex-wife, you know, in the media or anywhere else. So what's your perception of- Well, uh, you know, I'm, I remarried. My, I remarried and my uh, Kevin's stepmother has been very, very active in, in, mm -hmm. in his. Let me make a couple comments. Um, I agree, and I know that some people get frustrated because they say, well, your son's doing well, and uh, it is different. Uh, although Kevin was di diagnosed with early schizophrenia, it's because these doctors base it on a 10 minute interview and mm -hmm. you know they just, how that person presents. I mean, they imprecise of this. And schizophrenia is a whole different animal. I, I understand that. Uh, but before you say that I had it easy, think about this. Uh, well, I, don't think I, I knew, I knew no, I'm, I'm just saying if, you're, if your listeners yeah. said it. Yeah, there were advantages. I, I knew all these people. I still couldn't get my son help. <laughs> and he ended up getting tasered. And he ended up, you know, repeated hospitalizations. It's difficult to get in the system. It's more difficult if you have schizophrenia because they're even more bewildered about how to help someone with schizophrenia because that is such a, a different disease. I mean, bipolar is a mood disorder and medication usually works very, very well uh, in, in working with the different moods. Schizophrenia is a thought disorder and that is much more difficult to, to handle. So again, my heart goes out to you uh, because of that. I, you know, I don't, it is frustrating to me that so few, uh, that you often don't see many fathers stepping forward. And I think mm -hmm. that's partly because mothers, uh, how did I I'm gonna offend a bunch of people, but I think mothers <laughs> are used to taking on everything that their children uh, have problems with. And uh, again, that's we're not offended. We think that yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, NAMI was started by mothers. It wasn't fathers running up there. And I think a lot of fathers uh, are embarrassed or they feel like they've somehow failed. And, you know, I, th I, I think that's ridiculous. You know, this is an illness. There's nothing to be ashamed of uh, because, you know, people get illnesses. Um, I do think that some of the same things that help my son have been proven to help people with schizophrenia. If you can get a doctor who's knowledgeable about schizophrenia, and that's going to be difficult, and you can get medicines like clozapine and ones that, that you know may help, if you can get that right cocktail, and you can get that person then into housing or, you know... Um, I went out to Denver, Colorado. They have a fabulous program out there. Uh, it's based on the Fountain House model where you can have a job, but you may only be able to work for two hours. And then somebody else comes in. And there was a guy there, it was a recycling plan. And the guy there had schizophrenia and was hearing voices, but he was working his two hours. It gave him, you know, I mean, I, I don't believe it's possible to get better unless you you know, you have some something to look forward to in life. I, ab I absolutely agree. And, and even though the illnesses are somewhat different, I and Mimi has a question next, so I'm going to make this short. Um, I think there's so much that you brought up in your story that is necessary for all of us from the very vulnerable and deep feeling that we've all had, which was What's the point of his life if this is what his life is, is going to be? Like, I, I have felt that I, in the down moments. And then in the good moments, you're like, oh, we had another day where we made good memories, you know? So that's there. And the need, the need for services and the need for respect and the need to be treated like a human brain, being. So even though your son's illness may be sort of a, you know, another branch on the tree, you brought up a lot of important issues and, and in our after Mimi asks her question, 
we'll bring it to issues and, and what we want to talk about. So Mimi, you're on. Okay. Well, you know, when I, you said something about, you know, you wish more men would step up and uh, so do we. Yeah, um, we can't even get our husbands on this program. Yeah, I mean, you notice uh, we, we have to get the man's perspective by having you on. You don't see any of our husbands here. And that's, that's where my question uh, lives, is I've run into so much um, frustration dealing with his father, my husband, and he loves his son as much as I do, but there seems to be an inability to look at this and see it. And I'm just, I think a lot of women, a lot of the mothers have the same experience. You go to NAMI meetings, I go give talks. It's always 90% women. Yeah. What's up, Pete? Why aren't the men around? Well, I wish I had a good answer for you. I know many men who are actively involved, including those in NAMI. Um, I, but I can't answer that. I don't know why, you know, men, a lot of men are embarrassed. I, I have no idea. Uh, you know, all I know is that this was my son and um, I wasn't a doctor. Uh, I wasn't a professional. I didn't know much about mental health. And, uh, but this was my son. I mean, what can you do? It is your son. And I don't necessarily think that's a, a, a feeling that, it has to be divided between females and males. Uh, I mean, if your kid's hurting, you want to step in and maybe it has to do with empathy. Maybe it has to do with knowledge. And I mean, everybody has their own, you know, but I must, I want to say something because it, the whole thing about schizophrenia, I, it is a much more difficult road, I think, than many mental illnesses. Um, but you look at Ellen Sachs. I mean, you got to look at the, who wrote The Center Cannot Hold, who, you know, or you look at Fred Freeze. I don't know if you remember him or not. Who and I remember? served with him on the National NAMI board. Yeah. A man. Who was written off in a back ward. I, you know, there are stories out there. And as a parent, I found that I just so badly wanted to hear a story of hope. I mean, when I was in the jail in Miami, I'm going through this horrible prehistoric medieval type jail situation. Here's a cell that's built for two people that has six people in it. They're all naked. They're all psychotic. And I, I look down and under one of the bunks, there's a guy eating orange peels all curled up under there. I kept thinking that that's my son. And I, I just got so, so down. And then I'd meet somebody like Fred Freeze, or I'd meet somebody in NAMI. Mm -hmm. And I have my own issues with NAMI, but I'd cling to those stories. And that's why your books that you guys have written. And what I tried to do in my book is say, you know, I think you got to have hope because if you don't have hope, um, you know. You're not going to fight. No, you're not. You're not going to fight. And I, I'm not naive. Everybody's not going to get better. And we're going to lose people. But you have to believe that everybody can get better. Otherwise, nobody ever will. And we don't know. I, you know, I served on the board of Corporation of Supportive Housing, which finds housing for people with mental illness. And I was out at the LAMP project in L.A., uh, which works with street people. And if you saw the soloist, that's, you know, that's yeah. that uh, that's that program. A guy 20 years homeless on the street, psychotic, comes in and he finally wants to get help. And, you know, so it's there and they had that opportunity. Now, I can't speak to your son's situations, uh, you know, and I, I don't, you know, I think it was B.B. Moore Campbell who wrote a book about how she never blamed anybody who also gave up because these, I mean, it's hurt my family. And these are not easy on family dynamics, but I just, you know, you got to have hope. That's, yeah. that's how since I you, Just real quickly, since you dropped that line, I have to follow up. What are your issues with NAMI? I think we all have some, but what are yours? <laughs> well, you know, we talk about serious mental illness 
And traditionally that's been schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and severe and persistent depression. Well, in the last decade, NAMI has expanded the big tent and they've said, no, we're gonna take, it started with uh, uh, borderline personality. But if you look at the DSM-5, it has 400 different types of mental illness. And quite frankly, it's because psychiatrists want the biggest net possible so they can bring in as many people. They don't wanna deal with someone with schizophrenia. They wanna deal with somebody who's the worried well. You know, somebody yes. who's been divorced, who can't get along and has good insurance. But how do you define serious mental illness based on all this? And I think, Randy, that was one of your frustrations with uh, hiding in plain sight. I mean, it, they're throwing in eating disorders and everything else. But the right. problem is, when is something a serious mental illness? If you have a 14 year old girl who's being bullied and she starts cutting herself, and then ends up to take her life. Is that a serious mental illness? Now, I, I think that this is also blended into the recovery mo movement. And I think it's frustrating for a lot of parents. Uh, I call it the uh, beautiful mind syndrome, which is, oh, if you just love somebody, uh, they will get better and they'll, they'll heal themselves. And, uh, you know, you're a bad parent if you just don't, you just don't love them enough. I mean, I think that's where a lot of the guilt comes in. Absolutely. Uh, and it, there's something wrong with you. You know, I had a mental health professional tell me, oh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. If you look at the parents, you'll see why people have mental illness. That's before he knew I had a son with mental right. illness. Right, yes. But there's that attitude out there. There is, that, that's still and, there. And, you know, NAMI started as the NAMI mommies and everybody made, a lot of people made fun of them because they were trying to be controlling the schizophrenic mom. I mean, that's that whole thing that mothers cause schizophrenia. And, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on all the subtleties and all that, but I think NAMI has needs to rethink its real dedication to serious mental illness. And I think it also, it can do the other, but I think it really needs to address that. And I think it also needs to be, when you start getting millions of dollars, which it's done, it's budget 17, 18 million dollars. Now it's grown mm -hmm. tremendously and it's, you know, written, it has NFL that's players. That's the wide net. I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah, it has NFL players now. And But what happens then is it dilutes your message. It also makes you reluctant to, for instance, NAMI initially with Fuller Torre was all about assisted outpatient treatment. I mean, that was a big thing they pushed. Now they barely mention it. Now yeah. they shy away from it. Yeah. yeah and we I'll could... speak for myself, but maybe the others would chime in. I absolutely agree with you. And I've been on the national board, our state board. I just finished a term as affiliate cha president. And um, that is my beef with NAMI too. And, you know, another thing that's happened, and this is where I get people with uh, a loved one with schizophrenia get upset with me sometimes, is my son's a peer. And there's a strong feeling oftentimes with parents with schizo people with schizophrenia that peers are, uh, because peer groups are anti-AOT and that oftentimes a peer is useless. It's not going to help someone with schizophrenia. I disagree with that in the sense that if you can get a peer, like my son, there was a fellow with schizophrenia in his parents' basement, over 400 pounds, never came out. My son went over and met with him every day. And just having a friend, I mean, having people with mental illness are the most isolated people in our country. And nobody wants to have anything to do with them. I'm sorry, but that's just the reality. They don't want to date him. I mean, my son, you know, he's, he would love to find somebody, but as soon as the mental illness comes up and he's well known, it's, whoa, you know, yeah. these are some of the frustrations. So just having a friend, you know, one of the things about hiding in plain sight, my son went out to Billings, Montana, where the therapist in that um, uh, documentary is based and they had a two night premiere and he came back and he told me the same thing I heard from Jesse Close actually, which was, it was just so relaxing to be with people who are ill, who mm -hmm. are dealing with this, that you don't have to 
put on the show. I remember Jesse Close told me she was at McLean and Hospital. And let's just for our listeners, Jesse is um, she is Glenn Close's sister. Yeah. Uh, she suffers from bipolar, I believe. And right. her son has had schizophrenia as well. So I've met Jesse too, but that's just who we yeah. are referring to. And AOT is assisted outpatient treatment, which we've done an episode on. So good. So Jesse said that it was just when people came to visit, it was very stressful because she had to act a certain way when she was dealing with her illness, where just being with somebody who you could let your hair down and, you know, you hear a voice or somebody babbling you're not going to be judgmental because you've done that, you know, but it's hard to develop those relationships. I, I actually feel that way too, you know, with people with mental illnesses, it's very relaxing. If you go to a clubhouse or something. Right. And I think, you know, there's, I think I'm big on fountain house. I'm big on clubhouses. Different programs are, I want everything because you don't know mm -hmm. what that person is going to need or might help them at that time. And, um, you know, I think it's a crime that we don't throw money and, and well, we throw money, but not necessarily at the right program. Just looking at trying to help a person have uh, social connections. Uh, because I think people with mental illness want three things. They want a safe place to live. They want someone to love and they want to have a purpose in their life. And I don't think that's any different than what all of us want. It's just, they have more barriers to overcome. Right. And you know, treatment helps as well. Good treatment, throw some money at finding a cure, all of that. There's so many issues you've brought up and we only have a few minutes left. So Sorry. I want to just make sure, no, this is great. I mean, everything I was going to ask you, you've already spoken about. So that is, <laughs> you know, this isn't a question and answer session. It's a conversation. And so I've so enjoyed, even though I knew your story, you brought up other things I hadn't thought about. So I want to give Mimi one more chance to just see if there's anything you haven't had a chance to say. And then, um, then we'll just do a, a closing question. So Mimi, anything? You know, I, I really don't have anything. I'm just very interested in hearing what Pete said. It's just helpful. Yeah. Okay. So I would just say there's so much in your story that you brought up. Today, Pete early today, Pete and Kevin early today, what are the issues the most press, pressing issues you're fighting for and what would you like other dads slash parents, relatives, what would you like people to know? Well, there's a lot of specific things I'm fighting for. I'm fighting for better HIPAA laws so that parents can be involved. I'm fighting for families being included when doctors are involved and those kind of technical things, 988, blah, blah, blah. I think the biggest lesson I learned uh, as a dad is when you ask somebody, what do you want for your kids? You say, I want them to be happy. That's the one thing you can't do. You can teach your kid good manners. You can teach them money. You can teach them good morals. You cannot make another person happy. And the hardest thing for me as a father was stepping back and realizing I couldn't save my son. That I, I could do everything I could, but these are serious illnesses yeah. and it would rip your heart out, but you have to realize your own limitations. There's only so much you can do as a parent and you can go the second, third, fourth mile, but you have to realize these people, these people you love, like my son are on their own path. Yeah. And, and that's a hard, hard lesson to learn. It's a very hard. And my biggest fear, of course, is that my son's meds will quit working. Uh, and, and I'm dealing with a parent right now called me where 20 years, all of a sudden the meds aren't working. Their kids ends up in jail. So you know, I, I read something. I, I think it was somebody's meme on Twitter. It doesn't matter. But she she said that she spoke to a woman who happened to have Alzheimer's, but they were they were taking walks together every morning. And at one point, she asked the woman, I know you were a parent, that you are a parent. What would you say is the most important thing about parenting? And the woman said, I think the greatest gift you can give your children is to make good memories together. 
And I, to me, that was so profound. My son is on a time release medication and some visits are better than others, depending on the timing of the medication. And when we have a good day, I have learned to say, all right, we made some memories today. Good. That's beautiful. And, and then I think when it's it, a bit. Yeah. A big, it is a big fear to have the meds stop working. And since you've read my book, Pete, you know that Jim's closet, Pete, he got a granulocytosis and had to go off of it. So the meat of my book is those 15 years when he couldn't have a med that really right. worked. And then he's now back on it. And I'll just say, because we, you haven't, we haven't talked since the book came out, it's almost two and a half years now, he's back on closet, Pete, and he's doing really well. So the fear of meds that work not working I know that up close and personal. It's a huge fear. Parenting is scary, whether your kid has a serious mental illness or not. I mean, you can't make anybody happy, really. So it is their journey. And I remember someone telling me that. So I want to make sure you get a chance to tell people your latest book that's coming out, name your website, remind us about the documentary, and then we'll close with final words. Well, I don't. There's no point. The book that I've just finished is not about mental health. So, uh, you know, I do devote about 60% of my time to mental health. I've cut back a little on my blog, but I welcome stories by parents. Uh, my blog's at www.peterly.com. And the most well-read, I've had 240,000 readers. I average about 18,000 a month. I've kind of tapered off and I'm relying more on parents just telling their stories uh, because I find hearing from other parents and your books just really help me because you realize you're not alone. And, uh, you know, I, and I, you talk about NAMI to me, NAMI is are people like you who you go into their community and you see them working hard to change the system. It's not, the national office. It's not the lobbyist. It's not, to me, it's the individuals. Tom Insel said to me, we were in the White House at hiding in plain sight because he's in that. And he, I said to him, you know, I've been doing this 17 years. And some of you guys have been doing it longer than that. I said, I'm getting burned out. And I hate to admit that on your show, but I, <laughs> I feel like we're not moving the needle. Yeah, I feel and, you. And and he said, yeah, it's disappointing. We, we, we just seem, I mean, the same number of people are in jail as when I started, you know? And then I had a thought, if you change one person, if you help one person, then you've accomplished a lot. Throwing uh, that starfish back in the ocean. Yeah, I, and I, I, I maybe, you never know what your words are gonna do. I wrote a, a piece about psycho donuts, this place in California that I thought was just awful. And the local paper said, oh, he's getting all bent up shaped. They had no sense of humor, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Five years later, I got a note from a mother who said her son came in and asked for treatment and he'd been homeless for years. And when they took, emptied his pockets, he had the clipping that I'd written a piece of it that said, people with mental illness are not to blame. Uh, and he'd circled that over and over. Now, that's not because I'm such a good writer. That's because you never know what your words might do to help someone else, which is why I appreciate being on your, your podcast. We got to speak out. You got to write books. You got to speak out. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randykay.com.